Wander Middle-Earth in the Lore of the Rings podcast, where we wander the world of J.R.R. Tolkien. In the Lore of the Rings podcast, we explore the inspiring tales and rich mythology of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings Legendaria, and connect it to the movies and the new Rings of Power series. Available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more, you'll find a new lore-packed episode every Thursday. Come wander and not be lost with the Lore of the Rings podcast. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Jonathan R. Rose, author of the new novel, Wedlock. James M. Wright wrote about the novel, Wedlock. Jonathan R. Rose's feminist fable slices into the reader with a satirical razor of Angela Carter. The novel takes off like a runaway train. You think you know where it's going, but you have to ride it to the end. Jonathan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Sure. Well, if someone listening hasn't yet heard about your novel, Wedlock, how would you describe the novel? Um, well, I'm really glad that you used the uh, blurb that James uh, James Wright wrote. Um, I think it was very flattering, especially the comparison with the work of Angela Carter, which learned, anybody who wants to learn about her and the work she's done, it's really a big compliment considering what she's done for feminist literature and literature in general. But um, he, it, it is written very fast paced. It's just a book about a young woman from a highway town in, Me- in, um, in Mexico. Well, it was based in Mexico, but I don't specifically name it. And just, um, I just wanted to tell a story that kind of showed what happens when you meet what seems like Mr. Right, Prince Charming, the man that will take care of you. And just how everything can go completely off the rails. And uh, kind of like, a, you know, Prince Charming with a little bit of black mirror to it, all set in like a sprawling Latin American city. And it all takes place in under 200 pages. Wow. Um, <laughs> I'm curious, do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to write Wedlock? I do. Um, the story's actually, it has a long history. Um, when I first moved to Mexico, Uh, About 12, 13 years ago, I drove down from Toronto. I really wanted to pursue writing. It was almost unbelievably cliche, but I don't (laughs) care. It was fun. Packed up a 92 Toyota Camry and drove until the language changed and the weather improved. And um, was living there. And I had this idea based on visits and just things I've seen of just um, just the idea of um, real male superiority kind of thing but i didn't want to take it on in a in a very i didn't want to be boring about it and i also didn't want to show it from a sim an oversimplified way just the notion of possessive man bad woman good and just too simple so um the idea came years ago and i'm just paying attention i had a lot of friends both in mexico and here in canada and other places, um, female friends, in which they would just tell me their stories of what it was like having possessive boyfriends and just the things that were happening. And it was really unsettling. And so I wanted to tell a story that was imaginative about that, that took it um, in a different direction, but still showed it. And for this story, the character, the male character, his name's Diego, he really does love and care for the female character named Elena. He does love her. It's just, it's so warped. And so I almost, I didn't want to sympathize with him, but I just wanted to show the nuance. I wanted to show how it's not so cut and dry, but it's still bad. It's still rooted in a lot of negative things. And um, so I just wanted to show how this relationship on the surface can appear to a lot of people. And it does in the book from uh, Elena's friends and everybody. They're like, hey, he he treats you so good. He does everything for you. He loves you so much. What's the problem? And then how the story evolves and really reveals that problem. And I think it's a problem that happens everywhere. So I wanted to really explore that. And the book kept getting rewritten over a 10-year period. I would write it, wouldn't be happy with it, would put it aside, work on another book or another project. A couple of years later, I would uh, trim it, rewrite it a bit more. So it's a book literally over 10 years in the making. And so I'm curious, you talked about uh, driving down to to Mexico and you wanted to be a writer. Can you tell us what your initial fiction writing journey was that led you to writing and getting your first novel published? 
Well, uh, it's a it's a funny story. Uh, well, like a lot of writers, I'm assuming I've been writing books, little books, since I was like in the first grade, and I still have them. Actually, my mom would keep them. So I've always always loved writing, telling stories. Always been a big reader. Um, but I once suffered a back injury um, that was repeated, unfortunately, where I was in bed for over a year, and so during that time, it was either golf watching golf or soap operas or reading. And so I'd read and read a lot of the big classics, the War and Peace, the Don Quixote's, all of that. And I just fell in love with it. And I was just like, ah, I want to do that. I don't know if that's common for typical 22, 23 year olds, but I just love the worlds they were creating. And I was just, I just wanted to do that. So from there, I, I, I wrote my first book, I thought I would be Dostoevsky before I was 30. The first book was terrible, never got published. But what I was proud of was I finished it. And so after that, I was like, well, I finished it. I can write a book. And so I told myself um, I was leaving my job at the time. I didn't know what I wanted to do really, but I knew I wanted to write. So I thought, well, I like Mexico. I was visiting a lot. It's a lot cheaper than Toronto. And I just told myself, well, why not go for it? I had no real plan. I wasn't set to spend years and years there. I just wanted to change it, find a place where I could use some money to kind of stretch it and give myself the time to see. And next thing I know, years went by. I kept writing and finding ways to make enough money to keep doing it. And at 40 years old, I'm still doing that. So I'm really happy with the decision. That's great. Well, I know that you wrote and published a novel in Spanish. Can you tell us about that novel? Yes. Um, that book is called Gato y Lobo. Uh, in English, that means uh, cat and wolf. And uh, that story was written uh, a couple of years ago while I was in Mexico about in 2019 or so, 2018, 2019. And uh, it's uh, based on actual events, remarkably. And um, a teacher actually approached me through somebody very dear to me who uh, who told me, that they wanted me to talk to this teacher because she had this great story and she was interested in finding a writer to write it. And I was very flattered by that. And so I said, sure. So we met at this cafe in Mexico City, beautiful cafe. It's overlooking the Zocalo Square this in the center of the city. And she told me this amazing story about this student, this girl student who would come to class dressed up as a cat. She would have contact lenses like a cat, the ears. She would um, even move like one, hence Gato in the title. And it, and then the story, she told me it evolved, and it was about the relationship this girl had with this boy who everyone called Lobo, Wolf, because he had a beard and he was very gruff and aggressive, almost like a, a perfect foil to this girl. It was the type of thing that it was so amazing. It had to be true. You couldn't make this up. I couldn't make up this story. And she told me how it evolved and just that it was this tragic relationship. And I don't want to ruin too much from the story itself, sure. but it just, it it was like a Romeo and Juliet, but in like in today and based in Mexico city. And I was blown away. And so she's telling me all about this story, all in Spanish, of course. And I said, absolutely, I want to write this. I was very flattered that she asked me to. And so I got to work. It didn't take too long. Um, I didn't really have a set mission in terms of like, oh, this is for adults or anything like that. But we kind of knew that we wanted this to be read by students because it was about students. And it was from the perspective of a teacher. And so I wrote it. And uh, it was I was immensely proud of it. And I couldn't wait to see what the teacher thought. Above all, more than audience, I didn't really care at the time because this was her story. And if she didn't like it, if she told me, no, you butchered it, this is wrong, I would have scrapped it. But she loved it. She she even cried a little at what the things I did. And I had to take a little dramatic license, as anyone does when they tell a real story, just to connect everything. But the intense parts, the most important parts were based on truth. And she loved it. And from there, I was just the reception that it's gotten in Mexico. I mean, the pandemic really messed up so much in that book. It was just finished, ready to be promoted. And the pandemic hit right yeah. before a book tour was set to be to commence. I came back to Canada because of everything was just so sure. up in the air. This was March in 2020. So it really just 
I don't want to say destroyed because the book is still being promoted. Um, Wampo Editorial is doing a fantastic job getting it out there throughout Mexico and promoting it. But nonetheless, it's been read by students in schools in Mexico. Um, in particular, there was a school in, um, in Puebla, in the Mexican state of Puebla, and it's an indigenous school. The kids, Spanish isn't even their first language. Nahuatl is. And yet they read this book and they don't read a lot. They don't write a lot. And they loved it. And I mean, being able to talk to them on Zoom during the pandemic and them all holding up the book and them telling me like, this is so good. We really like it. We can relate to these characters. I mean, you can't beat that. And the ending is ambiguous because the reality of the story was left ambiguous. And that's part of the tragedy of the tale. And so it was presented to these students saying, well, um, what do you think happened? And it was remarkable. They all wrote their own endings. And like, they're not big writers. Even the teacher said it like, no, they don't write a lot. They wrote endings. I mean, four pages, some of them upwards of eight, nine pages. And they were amazing. I mean, some of them I would, I spoke to the people, to the students and I told them this is better than anything I could have come up with. <laughs> it, and they were like teenagers and everything. And they were so happy with, it was, it, the reception of it on an emotional level was immensely rewarding. And so with the pandemic, I don't want to say winding down, but with things being a little less unstable, um, the promotion of the book is ramping up again, and we're just really trying to get it out there in uh, Spanish. So, and That's from cool. there, I've also written an English version of a play that I'm hoping to get some attention to. And then from there, we'll just see how things go. But I'm really proud of the story. Tired of long waits and rushed care at the ER and urgent care clinic? Next time, stay home and let Dispatch Health bring the power of the hospital to you. I call Dispatch Health. A care team of medical professionals actually come to your house. They're the same caliber of people that you would see if you were at a hospital or an urgent care. Dispatch Health can treat most non-life-threatening emergencies. They can do the x-rays, they can do stitches. Urinary tract infections, blood tests, urinalysis, ultrasound. It's almost everything that they can do at the ER. You never feel rushed. They're there for you and only you. I felt like their only patient. And it costs no more than a trip to urgent care because Dispatch Health is covered by most insurance, including Medicare. See if we serve your home at DispatchHealth.com. Dispatch Health really went above and beyond. It's wonderful to have care come to your home. House calls are back and they're better than ever. Learn more at DispatchHealth.com. That's great. Well, you talked earlier about your writing of this new novel, Wedlock, and how you had written multiple versions of it and would take it out every few years. I'm curious, when you're working on a novel, uh, do you have kind of a similar process? Do you outline your novels extensively before you dive in, or do you just kind of dive into the narrative? How does that work for you? I do like structure. Um, I do like to have a sense of, um, what's this, what the story is going to encompass, but I'm not fiercely strict to it where I, I just like, I don't necessarily need to have the beginning and the end set in stone, but I do like to have an idea because the, uh, I always remember that first book I wrote, the very first one I th uh, that I mentioned earlier, that was just really bad, but it was great to finish mm -hmm. where I didn't really have a set, um, structure to it so it just went on and on and on <laughs> and like and i don't mean like a remembrance of times past by proust kind of on and on where it was like this epic scope no it was just rambling so to avoid that i i do like structure i do like having an idea of where it's gonna go and so when i have a story i do spend a lot of time kind of plotting it in my head taking a lot of notes of taking notes but at the same time, I like having flexibility because, and not to sound corny or anything, but sometimes characters will just change your mind because I mean, you, as the characters develop and which to me, I think developing characters is every bit, if not more important than developing plot. You need both to have a really cohesive, compelling story. And sometimes as maybe halfway, maybe a quarter in, your characters went a direction you didn't necessarily expect, but it feels natural. 
And so things you might have had planned near the end just don't work because you're like, yeah, it would work for the plot, but the characters wouldn't do this. So you got to shift it a little. So I, I actually kind of like that because it lets me know that, well, I created some good characters then if they're forcing me to change direction because they're changing. And I think any good story, your characters should change or evolve naturally. So I kind of constantly balance both. And behind Wedlock, that played a big part, that there was a lot of things where the characters kind of dictated much of where the story was going. Even though I did always have an idea of where it was going, I wasn't always clear how I was going to get there. That's great. So are you working on another novel now? I am. Um, recently actually finished one. Um, it's called The Heroes We Want and The Heroes We Get. This book is, uh, it took me, I basically worked on it throughout the entire pandemic. Um, I spent six months researching it in Vancouver Island. It's a nonfiction novel where everything is true, names, everything is true, but it's not a nonfiction book because I wrote it as a story. And uh, it's a 30 years in the making book. It's based on uh, my stepbrother, actually, who recently passed away. His name was Joey Fillion. And in 1988, he was the second most famous Canadian in the world. And um, I still have piles of old newspaper clippings and everything about him. And what happened was he was in a fire in his house where 98% of his body was third degree burnt. He should not have survived. No one survives more than 40, 50%. It was one of those just cases that if it happened in the age of the internet, it would have broke the internet, as they say. But he survived, and he was only 15 years old. And there was a narrative that the media at the time um, created that was only half true. And this is back in 1988, so the newspapers and the news was everything. It's where you got all your information. And he heroically survived, but the media made him into a hero for doing things he, that didn't happen the way they said. And he was only 15. He spent a year in hospital getting surgeries that were all experimental. He should have died 50 times, but he kept surviving. And so I was only a six-year-old kid, and my dad was with him at the time and raising him. So I was watching this separate family and these things happening as a child. So three decades later, um, keeping all these notes, seeing it firsthand, my father kept everything and said, Jonathan, you're the one to write this book. Because it wasn't just the fire, it was the decades after. I mean, this story had everything from a, him, Joey, getting kidnapped by like a cult leader to the media just propping him up to tear him down, a community building a house for him, but at the price of his privacy and them them turning on him, he would be poor. Like it just had so much. Again, this type of stuff you can't make up. So I just finished that, um, currently querying it, trying to get an agent for it, a publisher. So that's always a very hard road, very frustrating. But at the same time, I know it just takes one. So I'm really hoping to get that out. That sounds fascinating. I I'm curious, yeah. what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories or novels? Uh, I would say... Just think about the story when you're writing it. I've caught myself so many times feeling down because I'd be writing something and I'd be like, oh, this is this is really good. I'm, I'm really into this. And then I all of a sudden just get swept over. But yeah, but no one's going to read it. How am I going to get this out? I've gotten hundreds of rejections and you just start to spiral and you're just like, maybe I don't fit the market or whatever. And I would it would be so hard to not let that affect the work itself, the writing itself. So I would just tell any writer, just put that out of your head. It's going to suck and not be fun. Or it could be if you enjoy marketing yourself, which I hate and anything like that. And the getting it published, whatnot, it's to just ignore that when you're writing, just work on the story, just trying to make it the best you can love every day of it. Wake up every morning, excited to write it. Just, Focus on the writing, make it the best you can. And then once you're, once it's finished, then you can get into the, the process of getting it out and whatever frustrations that entails, but never combine them. Just put it out of your head the minute it's in there. I've been doing this for over 
professionally for since 2015, but much longer. And that to me has always been the biggest challenge. That's some good advice. Um, <laughs> I'm curious, what books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Uh, I read constantly. For me, it's like exercise. Every day I have to, I read for at least an hour. I do take that concept that if you're going to be a good writer, you need to be a great reader. And so, um, right now I'm actually reading a book by C. I'm just looking at my shelf here. Mm -hmm. It's by CLR James. It's, um, called the black Jacobins. It's actually about the Haitian revolution. Um, and mainly about the person that led it, whose name I will always pronounce wrong. I hope I didn't butcher it. His name is Toussaint Louverture and, uh, just an incredible story. And so I'm currently reading that, um, before that, I've been reading a bunch of Graham Greene novels and uh, some Chinua Achebe novels as well. So I've been keeping really busy with the reading. That's great. Well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your new novel, Wedlock? Uh, definitely my website. I think that would be the easiest. Uh, it's an easy name. It's www.jonathan, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N, R. Rose. Dot com. It's all one word, just jonathanrrose.com. And every, all the links for my books are there. All the uh, media I've done is there. There's an about me page there. It talks about all my influences and such. And uh, yeah, everything is on the website. Even the links to my uh, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, it's all there. That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Jonathan R. Rose, author of the new novel, Wedlock. The novel is on sale now, so go buy a copy. And Jonathan, thanks for doing this interview. Thank you very much for having me, Jeff. I had a great time. Absolutely. Tired of long waits and rushed care at the ER and urgent care clinic? Next time, stay home and let Dispatch Health bring the power of the hospital to you. I call Dispatch Health. A care team of medical professionals actually come to your house. They're the same caliber of people that you would see if you were at a hospital or an urgent care. Dispatch Health can treat most non-life-threatening emergencies. They can do the x-rays, they can do stitches. Urinary tract infections, blood tests, urinalysis, ultrasound. It's almost everything that they can do at the ER. You never feel rushed. They're there for you and only you. I felt like their only patient. And it costs no more than a trip to urgent care because Dispatch Health is covered by most insurance, including Medicare. See if we serve your home at DispatchHealth.com. Dispatch Health really went above and beyond. It's wonderful to have care come to your home. House calls are back and they're better than ever. Learn more at DispatchHealth.com.